Integrity is one of those words that if I ask 10 people what it meant, I get 10 different answers. And so we could start with the root of the word. Integrity comes from integral or integrated, integrus. It means to be integrated and to live in alignment with that integration. Welcome to the Mark Divine Show. I'm your host, Mark Divine. In this show, we discover, we dive in and discuss what makes the world's most inspirational, compassionate, and resilient leaders so fearless and, on the flip side, so courageous. We talk to people from all walks of life here, martial arts grandmasters, like my grandmaster, Tadashi Nakamura, meditative monks, top CEOs, elite military leaders, stoic philosophers, amazing survivors, and many, many more. In each episode, we dig into our guests' life and experiences, and we turn them into actionable insights that you can learn from and use to lead a life of compassion, courage, and commitment. And today, guess what? This is the first show of season number nine. Wow. Pinch me. (laughs) I can't believe we've done eight seasons of this thing. Holy cow. Well, you'll notice that this year we've changed the format. This is now the Mark Divine Show no longer the Unbeatable Mind show. And we've got an incredible lineup this year of amazing guests. And this, the first show of 2022, by the way, Happy New Year. This first show, I just wanted to kind of share some thoughts on the past year and the coming year. And then um, we've got some questions from our um, social media audience that we asked them about things that were interesting or important to them. My friend Amy's here to help me a little bit. But no doubt, 2021 was a challenging year for all of us. Probably front and center was this pandemic that doesn't seem to want to go away. Also, a lot of political divide, a lot of work-life balance issues that stem from economic situations. A lot of people challenging old belief systems and assumptions and making changes in their lives. I think from the people that I've talked to and observed, 2021 really, really tested a few things. First, it tested people's patience right? Is this thing going to be over? This pandemic going to be over? Yeah, it's going to be over. Then, oh no, it's not over. Look at this. We got another variant coming. Okay. That one passes by. I think it's over. And then, oh no, do we have to wear a mask or do we not have to wear a mask? Are we locked down? Can I go in this store or not go in this store? I mean, am I going to survive as a small business owner? I recently read a comment that 70, 80% of small business owners need this holiday season to be exceptional or else they will not survive into the new year. I mean, that's frightening. And if you're a small business owner, I feel for you because I've been there. I understand how important holiday sales are for small retailers and restaurants because January and February are really tough months. So you need the cash flow. So it's testing your patience. It's also tested our adaptability muscle. So we've had to become really flexible. I was talking earlier with Amy about how we can't plan anymore. It seems like plans have gone out the window. How many of you listening have canceled vacation plans, canceled trips to see family, and are uncertain about even 2022, whether you're going to be able to travel somewhere? That's really trying on us. So we've got to learn how to deal with that. Work-life balance, that's a biggie. So we came up with a whole new term, the great resignation in 2021. I don't know how many people, it's like one third of the workforce or more has resigned this past year. Literally, up and walked away from their their jobs. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons that people have studied this. Some just had shitty jobs. And they said, we don't need to do this anymore. Okay? And so they took a look at their lives and said, well, you know, I I can really do things differently. So that's a good outcome. Some people got really, really used to working from home. And when their employer said, oh, when this thing's over, you're coming back. They said, no, I'm not. Then they left to find something that, that give them more freedom and independence. The past year just caused everyone to pause and to ask different kind of questions. What's important to me? What do I want my future to look like? Not just next year, but in 10, 20 years. And am I on that trajectory or not? And they're coming up with the answer and saying, no, I'm not on that trajectory. Obviously, there's a lot of political consternation and divide even within families over vaccines. Like what an interesting subject that that has brought up. It's kind of the most recent thing to kind of split people apart. You know, before that, it was anything to do with politics. And before that was anything to do with religion. But so now we got to add one more thing that can split people apart. So that requires sensitivity and perspectives because there's no right answer in any of this stuff. So it's an opportunity for us to grow beyond our own limited perspectives and be inclusive with people who are on other sides of the fence than us. Another thing that was really challenging for a lot of people in 21 was this feeling of basically just falling off track. 
you had some momentum with your health goals, your fitness goals, you know, your strength training, your nutrition, all these things. And suddenly, because everything changed so rapidly and with such uncertainty that a lot of that just went by the wayside. And so that is also a great opportunity for us to look at our habits and to wonder whether we're doing things for intrinsically motivated reasons or are we truly at the beck and call of whatever crisis or turbulence is going on outside of us? And I think a lot of people found that they were under the external influence and something that came up that was a big one gave them permission to back off of their health and their nutrition and even their mental wellness habits. And then that caused a lot of harm. And so we've got to reassess what's important and find the internal motivation to do those regardless of what goes on in the world around us. And that's a core stoic principle, by the way. Control what you can. The only thing you control is what's going on inside of you and your habits and your beliefs and what you're going to put your attention on. And so a lot of you right now at the end of this year or early now in 2022, you're thinking, okay, enough of that, right? I'm done with all of this stuff. I'm done with being impatient. I'm done with being inflexible. I'm done with not knowing how to plan my future. I'm done with falling off track and not having the discipline to stay the course with my fitness and my yoga and my martial arts and my nutrition and all that. So you're tired of having things fall apart. And let's start back with that stoic principle. It's like the only thing you control is what's inside of you. And what's inside of you is your self-concept, your beliefs. And so a theme that I want to start 2022 with is this idea of integrity. And integrity is one of those words that if I ask 10 people what it meant, I get 10 different answers. And so we could start with the root of the word. Integrity comes from integral or integrated, integrus. So it means to be integrated and to live in alignment with that integration. So what does that mean? Well, one person's integrity is going to be different than another person's integrity. I'm not just talking about the definition of the word. Even if we defined it the same way, Jeff's integrity is going to be appropriate for Jeff and not Mark. Amy's integrity is going to be appropriate for Amy and not Jeff. What it means to me and why it's important for us in 2022 and how it relates to everything I just talked about with regards to 21 and the pandemic and all the challenges we face is is a lot of people hadn't taken the time and done the introspection to ask themselves, what does integrity to mean to me? And how do I be integrated and live in alignment with that? And so what that means is to do the work of what the Stoics were asking is control what you can control. And there's nothing outside of you. It's everything inside of you. And so to ask yourself, what is it that's inside of me? When I say inside, I really mean your introspective self, not less like your heart and your lungs. What's inside of me is beliefs that I have The concept that comes up when you ask the question, who am I, such as I'm a spiritual being having this human existence, or you could be completely on the other side of the fence saying, no, this is all there is, this body, this this life I have, and that's fine. There's no right answer here. They're just different perspectives, but it, it changes your sense of self and what that means for how you organize your guiding principles for your life, which is kind of the next thing. So then beyond beliefs, beliefs are broad based concepts around what you think to be true based upon what you've been either told is true or what you've learned is true through your experiences in life. And so those form these beliefs, which often, you know, we call biases because a bias is neither good nor bad. It just is. It's basically saying that your view is not the same as someone else's view. And that's because your beliefs are not the same as someone else's beliefs because you have a wholly fundamental different set of inputs than another individual. There's a lot of similar inputs, but they're going to be different based upon your parents, the culture you grew up in, your peers and friends when you were a kid and all that kind of stuff. So they form your basic and fundamental beliefs, the culture of origin. So then we can take those beliefs and we can examine them and say, okay, within that set of beliefs, there are certain things that I value and there are certain things I don't value. So we call those values. And that's also a judgment thing to say there's good values and bad values. It really depends upon the perspective, how rooted you are in positionality. And I'll come back to that. You might say, well, I value my health. I value my health for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is because I have been gifted this athletic body that has a lot of endurance and capability. And so I can use that body to help serve the country. So I did that for a period of years as a Navy SEAL. And the body can also serve me as an exemplar and a coach to help other people get strong. So I've did that for a number of years with SEAL Fit. And my body as a fit vessel, which includes my organs of of thinking, to be able to communicate effectively over a long period of time, it needs to be fit and healthy. So there's a lot of reasons that I value my health. And because I value my health, 
then I'll organize my life around that value system, one of several, such that I optimize my health, regardless of what's going on around me. That's an internally driven thing that I can control. My locus of control is firm there. I can control my actions and behaviors around this value of health, which is based upon a belief that I need this body to be strong and fit for as long as it's possible, and that it has the capacity to be strong and fit for a very long time. That's my belief system. Based upon how I grew up and the input that I choose to put into my mind, i.e. the books I read and the people I've trained with, and so then that informs my daily habits. And so my daily habits include pretty rigorous commitment to yoga and strength training and some sort of high intensity interval training. And I'll do that five times a week, rain or shine, travel or no travel. And then I'll allow myself a full rest day and an active recovery day. So that, and then I have a belief that human beings have the capacity for continuous evolution, continuous growth, the capacity to evolve to the highest potential that they could express in a lifetime. Now, that's a belief. Not everyone shares that belief. Like Carol Dweck, who wrote the book Mindset, she said, a significant number of people have a fixed mindset and a smaller number of people have a growth mindset. Well, growth mindset means you believe that you have the capacity to grow. Statistically, I read a stat a while ago, I don't know if it's still relevant, that 5% of humanity believes that they can grow and the other 95% believes that I got what I got, I am who I am and I'm never going to change. <laughs> I know a lot of people like that. So I have a belief that a human being can grow. I guess I'm part of the 5%. So that belief then has led to a value of what I call a lifetime of practice, that life is a practice. In fact, I'm studying Aikido now as part of my practice, and we just read The Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi, who was a famous swordsman in Japan. And he talks about, his whole book is around this concept. He calls it Heiho, H-E-I-H-O, I think. Yeah, Heiho, like Heiho, Heiho, it's off to work I go, pretty much. And the work is the practice. So your life as a practice includes disciplines around physical training. Okay, so check. I cover that in another value system around optimal health. But this notion that day by day in every way, I'm going to do something to get better and wiser and stronger and to grow. And so then I have to take a look at the things that I need to do that are unique to me that are going to help spur my growth and then even accelerate that growth. And also to develop a self-concept of what that growth looks like. What does it mean for me? What does the evolution of my consciousness, my mind, and my spirit mean for me? And so in order to really answer that question, I have to then investigate another belief that I have, and that is that all human beings have a purpose, a reason, deatre, right? A reason for being on this planet. Not everyone agrees with that. So that's a belief. So you ask yourself, do I believe that to be true, that I have a purpose? If that's the case, that I believe that, what is it? It's not easy for some people to uncover their why or their purpose. And, and other people, it just like comes to them or it's forced on them through some sort of calamity or very challenging circumstances like the individual Elijah that I interviewed yesterday, who's got multiple dystrophy and you know isn't expected to live past 25, but he's firmly committed that he will. So his life's challenges have helped him uncover a purpose, his purpose. So the belief system that you have a purpose, then answer the question, what is it? Why am I on this planet? Then helps you craft your hey-ho or your practice because you're going to want to develop your life practice so that it's going to bring out the qualities and allow you to be the type of person that is capable and worthy of fulfilling that purpose. You see how I've identified just off the cuff three belief systems that then can be articulated as value sets, which then show up as behaviors. And those behaviors can be habits, they can be goals, they can be rituals, and all of the above. In fact, I recommend that as you go through this thinking in this kind of order, is like, first, recognize that the Stoics were right. I can only control what's in my internal locus internally, right? I can't control what's happening outside of me. There will be another variant of this pandemic. There will be another call for mass mandates and for a vaccine. Man there will, you know, that's just the way things are this day. And you can align with it or not align with it. That's okay. Part of the practice is to gain perspective and not demonize other people that don't agree with your position on it. Also, the body needs to be healthy. And so to cultivate the practices and attitudes and daily habits to keep the body healthy and strong, the belief that you can grow. And so what does that mean for you? Do you organize your life differently 
so that you can accelerate your development. In Unbeal Mind, we say that has to be done in five domains, physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and spiritually. And what are you going to do every day to develop yourself in long nose? Then we have this belief around a lifetime of practice. So your life is basically a becomingness. And so we practice becoming. Like you don't just expect to be a concert pianist just because you desire to be a concert pianist. You have to practice. And you ask any world-class pianist, they're always practicing. They're never there. And so your life is like that. You're always practicing to be the best version of yourself in life. So what are you going to do about that? Turn your life into a practice. And in order to do that, the final point here is you've got to understand who you are and why you do what you do, which means you have to understand your purpose or be moving toward clarity of purpose. Now, when you are clear around your purpose or your why, and you've investigated the dominant belief systems that drive or providing momentum in your life or holding you back, so get rid of the ones holding you back and then reinforce the ones providing you momentum, and then you've been able to articulate a small range of very important values, I recommend five to seven. You don't want to be overwhelmed with having to build practices and habits around too many values, but that's five to seven are really good. Three to five even, probably more like five to seven. For me, it's around health and longevity, this idea of practice, this idea of always becoming in a, more in alignment with my purpose. So there's three values, connecting with my family and others. So deepening my relationship, which requires a practice around listening and presencing and opening my heart and a practice around building an organization or organizations that can impact a lot of people to help communicate some training. So there's some values there. There are others, but those are like dominant for me and that will inform how I organize my days. So when you get clear on your purpose, your why, and you examine the beliefs and you reinforce the positive beliefs that give you momentum and you reject the negative ones or really penetrate the negative ones and ask why they're holding you back. And then you take those positive beliefs and you craft a limited set of values around them. And then you take those values and you develop habits, goals, and rituals around those. Now you've got an internal sense of integrity. Everything's coming into alignment. Years ago, if you had asked me what integrity meant, I would have said when your thoughts, words, actions, and feelings are all aligned. That's powerful. Can you imagine like the force of a laser beam you know, with 10,000 gigawatt laser beam is what happens when thoughts, words, actions, and feelings are all aligned. But then the question is aligned around what? And so this brings me back to everything that we've been talking about. Integrity is when those things are all aligned around your why, clarity around your beliefs, clarity around your values, which then provide clarity around your daily actions and habits and a focus on them. And all of this happens in spite or regardless of what's going on in the world around you, regardless of who the people are in your life, the fact that it'll affect who's in your life, regardless of what happens on the network news, regardless of what the latest Dr. Fauci pronouncement is, you just stay true to yourself. That's integrity. You stay true to that true north. Why? And those beliefs that are giving you momentum and those values that are tied to those beliefs that lead to actions every single day that you just do. And you do them because it's who you are. Not because you read it or listened to it on a podcast. It's because it's who you are and they're non-negotiable. So with that kind of integrity, we can overcome impatience because we know that today's no different than any other day. I learned from Tadashi Nakamura, my grandmaster, this concept of one day, one lifetime. This day is a precious opportunity regardless if I didn't get on a plane to go to South Africa, regardless if I have to wear a mask to go shopping, you know, regardless if I'm vaccinated or unvaccinated. It's a precious day, which means it's a precious opportunity for me to live in alignment with my values and integrity, which means I'm going to get up and work out. I'm going to get up and meditate, right? I'm going to go to work. I'm going to be the best version of myself. I'm going to show up and I'm going to evolve and I'm going to be a good person as best I can. I'm going to try to connect deeply with my family. You know, I'm going to do those things that are in my internal locus of control because I've clarified what they are and why they're important to me. So I can be very, very patient because all I have is today. And then I get through today and I learn from what went well and what didn't go well. And I recover from any regrets as part of our evening ritual. And then I plan to get a great night's sleep. And I hope that I wake up in the morning so I get to do it again. That's one day, one lifetime. All you got is this opportunity right here, right now. So that brings great patience and equanimity. We don't care about waiting for the next thing to happen outside of us. 
I mean, we care, but it's not going to affect us that much. It also brings great motivation to stay true to your hey-ho, your practice. One of the challenges that people have when they discover even the notion of a practice, like if you come to yoga, yoga is a lifetime practice, martial arts, lifetime practice. In the West, it's kind of a newer concept. I remember in the SEALs hearing the phrase that uh, special operators can't be mass produced. It takes about five years before a Navy SEAL is competent enough to really, really be trusted by their teammates. And so it cultivated this sense that we are always kind of growing. We had to earn our Navy SEAL trident every single day. That was one of the concepts that helped me stay true to my practice because years and years and years of that requirement to stay focused on daily and never ending improvement to the reinforcement of that value system. So when you have that notion of a life practice and you see the results, even after a few months, and it's that important to you because you understood or your connection to your why, then you're more likely to stay true to your practice, to stay on the path. It's very easy to fall off a path if you're not clear why it's really important to you. So in 2022, we're going to be more patient with the one day, one lifetime principle, and we're going to stay true to our practice. And we're going to trust ourselves. We're going to trust that we know what's right for us because we've done the work, we're doing the work of self-awareness, of analyzing the why question and the beliefs and the values and then our habits associated with them so that we can live in integrity. And then finally, I just want to say, we're going to learn to be more adaptable because if anything, 21, 2021 showed us is that change is inevitable, change is persistent, and change appears to be accelerating. We have a new course coming out in January at Unbeatable called the Exponential Leadership. And so we're, we want to help people become extremely adaptable and to be able to deal with exponential change, exponential technological change and adoption. And all this is happening so fast that it causes the human mind to feel like things are speeding up. And the only way to deal with that is to actually speed up our minds. The only way to speed up your mind is to get out of the old cause and effect linear incremental thinking mode, which we've been trained to do. And so the only way to do that is through meditative practices. And the speed of awareness is instantaneous. The speed of thinking is like glacial compared to that. So we need to develop the mind to be an exponential mind so that we can have instantaneous perception instead of slow glacial strategic planning type perspective or mindset. And so that's another thing that we have to look forward to in 2022 is this development of this mindset that everything's changing and the change is appearing to be accelerating. So get used to it. It's not going back to the old way. There is no going back. This is the new normal and it's going to just keep getting faster and faster. Again, that's a perception. It's not reality, it's a perception. And so we have to adapt our mindsets so that we can keep pace with it. We can be in real time and that requires us to be in presence to develop our witnessing mind so that we can operate at that speed. So lots to look forward to in 2022, built upon the lessons from 21. The lessons 21 were impatience, inflexibility, the inability to plan, challenges with work-life balance, and things falling apart for us. So we have this incredible opportunity in 2022 to, to slow down and ask better questions, to look within, to take care of what we can take care of, which is what's on the inside, identify and clarify our purpose, our why, identify the beliefs that gives us positive momentum and start eradicating those that are holding us back, develop a strong set of values that support those beliefs, and then develop habits and rituals and goals supporting those values. And then to show up every day, one day, one lifetime to do the work, to become the best version of yourself possible. And in that way, you'll develop patience and equanimity. You'll stay true to your practice. You'll trust yourself more. You'll become very adaptable, develop that exponential mindset and you'll live in integrity. Okay, we're going to take a short break here from the Mark Divine Show to hear a short message from one of our partners. I recently received a question from a listener. She wanted to know if it was possible to avoid digestion problems by eating only healthy organic food. It's a nice thought, but unfortunately, just not possible. You see, your natural ability to digest food declines with age. This is because your body produces fewer enzymes which are the proteins responsible for digesting food. Fewer enzymes means more difficulty digesting food. 
Even organic foods won't provide enough enzymes to properly digest them. This is especially true if you cook your food because cooking kills the enzymes. This is why you may have digestion problems even after a healthy meal. Your body just can't produce enough enzymes to get the job done. This is where supplementing with high-quality enzyme supplements can be a huge help. I personally recommend Masszymes by Bioptimizers. It's a best-in-class supplement loaded with full-spectrum enzymes for digesting proteins, starches, sugars, fibers, and fats. Taking Masszymes daily helps top off your enzyme levels and replace the enzymes that your body is no longer producing, which means you'll be able to eat all sorts of delicious foods and digest them quickly and effortlessly. After you start taking Masszymes, you may notice that you no longer feel bloated after meals and that your belly feels flatter. And if you have a leaky gut, Masszymes could reduce gut irritation and help you absorb even more nutrients. Verified buyer Mike C. gave Masszymes a five-star rating saying, quote, it has definitely helped me address digestion and health issues, end quote. Listen, life's too short to suffer from digestion problems. If you want freedom from your food, especially during the upcoming holiday season, try Masszymes risk-free and experience for yourself the magic of high-quality enzymes. For an exclusive offer for my listeners, go to masszymes.com forward slash unbeatable. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com forward slash unbeatable. Use the code unbeatable10 to get 10% off. Again, that link is masszymes.com forward slash unbeatable. Use the code unbeatable1010. Thank you very much. And now back to the show. Now, we got some questions, right, Amy? We do, but I have a question for you because you spend time thinking about your why and your values and your beliefs. How do you even get there? Someone can sit there and you can think about your values and you can say they're this, this, and that, but how do you create them and stick to them? Simon Sutton said it's, it all starts with why, and I agree with him. Now, he was talking about business, but it's true for a human being. I think this is one of the biggest challenges, Amy, is that people are so busy and so distracted. And it almost seems like it's by design. Somehow our economy and our culture evolved to keep human beings really distracted and not feeling like they even have the time to meditate. You know, let's just say that meditation means answering these questions. But let's be clear about what that means. Meditation means taking the time to sit in silence, undistracted. TV's not on. You're not scrolling through your news feed or your social media feed. You're not chatting it on the side. You're sitting in silence and you're asking the questions. The master question from the Indian sages is, who am I? And if you're too distracted to ask that question, then what you're identifying with, Amy, is everything that's outside of you. And so you might mistake yourself for your degree, you know, or your job or your body. I mean, look what's happening with TikTok and young women, right? So that's a real problem because they're identifying with something that's outside of themselves. When I say outside, the body is outside of yourself or it's a physical object. It's it's something out there. So how I did it was to begin to value that time of quietly sitting with my mind, examining how it worked, for one, and asking that question, who am I? And I went through successive layers of discarding things that I thought would answer that question, right? And so in my early 20s, I had to recognize that I was not this MBA, CPA, hard-charging athlete. There was something inside of me that was different than that. And that told me that I was, you know, pointing me toward the warrior traditions. So I became a Navy SEAL. And then as I continued that practice, I had to disidentify with that, even though people like to put that back on me. I don't identify myself as Mark Devine Navy SEAL, just like I don't identify myself as Mark Devine, MBA, CPA, former Coopers and Librand person. Like, that'd be silly of me to do. And so the more you do this practice, the more you look for the answer inward. You look around in your psyche and you're like, okay, am I this set of beliefs, right? And you look around in your psyche and you're like, I can't find any beliefs in here. Like, I can't grab onto anything. They're just a bunch of concepts floating around that I can literally change in an instant. And so I'm not that either. Because who's looking for these set of concepts? Who's the looker? And so then you start to look for the looker, you start to observe the observer, and you recognize, oh, yeah, that's who I am. So I'm asking the wrong person. I'm asking my ego those questions. I need to be asking that other aspect of myself. That's where meditation really kicks in, Amy, is you begin to ask from the perspective of of your witnessing self, your spirit, your soul, whatever word we want to insert, Fred, ask Fred. (laughs) 
And when you ask Fred, aka your internal guidance system, your spirit, who am I? Why am I on this planet? And you listen carefully, you start to get answers. And that's what we call intuition. You start to get answers. And when I asked those questions on the meditation bench when I was in my 20s, that's why I got the sensation and feeling and also imagery about being a warrior. And that's what led me to the SEALs. And it was 100% the right path for me. If I had not slowed down in meditation, looked within, disidentified with all the this is and that's and the other things that I thought used to think made up who I was, and began to connect to that higher mind, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I'd be living that life of quiet mediocrity. So that's how you find it. Uncovering your why is, is challenging. The answer is inside. You can't look for it outside of you. But just that slowing down, I mean, we've been all pushed and shoved in the past year and a half. Yeah. And it feels like it's happening all over again. But that notion to slow down and really think and look inside is a great way to start the new year. Yeah. If that's the one thing you get out of 2021 is that it's time to slow down and look within, then hallelujah, welcome to the rest of your life. Because that's exactly what's needed by everybody across the globe. Unless you're an Aborigine somewhere and, you know, has got all the time in the world. And I'm sure they've got their challenges, of course. But like I said, it's almost like the whole system was designed to keep everyone distracted, to keep them from doing what we're talking about in the Western world, because distracted mind ends up being always in craving, always looking for something. And so then it's easily to manipulate, to buy something. You're trapped, basically. You're not free. You're not entirely free until you begin to look inside and understand your why and to be able to live in alignment with that. That's integrity that we were talking about. Integrity, that discipline for integrity brings you freedom, freedom of choice, freedom to not be manipulated by the latest consumer ploy or TikTok feed. Living integrity basically means I'm taking back control, taking back my power and not being someone else's pawn. I know that, you know, sounds silly in the context of this discussion, but sometimes you just have to really look at it really simply. Am I free? Well, I'm not free if I'm beholden to belief systems that aren't true to my higher self. If you haven't fully investigated your belief systems through a process of introspection because you're too busy, then you have to ask yourself, am I really free? And do I value freedom? I truly believe that the human spirit compels people toward freedom, more and more freedom, right? Freedom to create, freedom to express, freedom to live in alignment with your purpose or your why. And I think that's why we had that great resignation. A lot of people did take time this year. They were forced, right? And they said, holy shit, I'm not free in this, in this job that I feel like a pawn or put the handcuffs on and I'll go to work and I'll be a little robot for a while. And that's the problem. Like this exponential leadership course, one of the concepts is that robots will be doing what we were trained to be doing in our lifetimes, right? So the industrial information age, human beings were trained to do tasks. And even if those tasks included organizing information, so the knowledge worker, and those are all going to be done. Knowledge work and actually a lot of labor is going to be done through AI and robots. So then what does that leave humans? Well, it leaves humans the creation category. So we get to conceive new things and we get to create new things. And so we've got to basically retrain our minds to be amazingly good at, at creation and conceptualization because that, those are the talents. Those are the skills of the future. And those are found by looking within. You know, everything we're talking about, creation is an expression of your inner spirit's drive for freedom and for expression. And so you don't become a great conceptual thinker and leader or a very creative person by staying radically distracted and constantly doing things and running from here to there like a chicken with your head cut off. You get those skills by sitting down. You asked how many people resigned in that great resignation. And it looks like one in four, and that's over 4 million people a month. 4 million a month. Just get, wrap your head around that number. Yeah. And it's not slowing down, is it? No. I don't know if there's a certain type of industry or type of company that these people are quitting from, but I imagine it's the globalized companies that didn't treat human beings as humans, right? They treated them as human resources. Well, we should do a podcast. We should reach out, any people listening. Yeah. Um, and maybe we interview people who've resigned and why and what is their purpose and how have they found it. Well, even if resigning was to find your purpose, that's noble. Right. Yeah. Right. Because you you were there too. I mean, everyone listening has been in those jobs. 
it's just a, such a grind to get up day after day after day, put the suit on, you know, we remember commuting to the office. <laughs> oh, my, oh my God. God. And then dealing with all the office politics, all the deadlines and the promotions. And yeah, you can learn a lot and you can make good money. But when we look back at it, I'm like, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you have to put a gun to my head to get me to go back. Even if they offered me an immediate partnership at Accenture or whatever, I'd be like, are you kidding me? To give up this lifestyle I have where I have total freedom over my time and I can train until 10 in the morning and I wouldn't do it. Yeah, but I'm going to challenge you at your age or my age, maybe. But the other flip side is all this freedom and independence, then there isn't the connectivity. And especially when you're in your 20s or 30s, there's the mentors are gone then. So there is a push too by this freedom and doing what I want. 100%. I'm saying I wouldn't do it with the structure of the current structure. I think it's great to work for those companies and have those pure connections and to get the exposure. Working for a big consulting firm like McKinsey or Accenture or any firm, you know, you work for Unilever. What an incredible exposure to marketing and, you know, everything that came with that strategy and just all the business drivers for success at a company like Unilever. That was really, really powerful. What's got to change is corporations will need to treat human beings like their main asset, not like resources, not like input to the production machine. And so the good ones are starting to recognize that. And they're like, oh, okay, this is actually our most important asset, right? Company is the people. I shared this. It's a fascinating article. What will work look like in 2030 by a guy named Jeff Hesse and Scott Olson. Real quick, basically, they say there's four possible worlds. So the first one is basically what they call red world. That's very much like the first plateau of our five plateau, survivor plateau. This is where the world is very individualized and fragmented and small is powerful. And um, technology allows basically anyone, like we're seeing with the blockchain, a small group of people to build a massive organization very, very quickly and to really break down and confront the behemoths, Facebook and Google. And so they lose relevance and now it's kind of like game on. Eye for an eye, it's warfare in business for talent and for the most creativity and for intellectual property. We have aspects of that already happening, right? And it's very interesting. And you got to be on your game or else you could be toast. In this red world, there's not a lot of safety nets and, and fallback positions. The second one is kind of where we are today. And they call it blue world, where the corporation is king. And this is individualized and integrated and global corporations rule. And top talent is fiercely fought over. And again, this is 2030 we're talking about. And to work for those top global companies, you will have to be a connected human being, Uh meaning you will have sensors. And basically, part of your contract is to agree to peak performance for that organization. So think about that. That's really interesting. And if you're not in, right, if you're not one of the protected working for one of these major corporations, then what? You're a freelancer or you're back in the red world or individually. That's fascinating. The third is called the green world. And this is, I think, where we're heading. So this, I think that we're going to have the elements of the last two, even though the first two might still be germane in 2030. But this is a collective and integrated world where social conscious, environmental responsibility, diversity, international regulations, human rights drive a more ethical and ecological agenda. Notice they didn't really talk about people, but there is a sense that people and society become guardians of the brand in this green world. And so the people start to take more and more importance, right? This is kind of back to what we were talking about. We're heading into green world right now. And organizations are recognizing that DEI and environmentalism and conservation and people have to be more than just a few statements in annual report. And you know what's driving that is the people. Clients and employees are saying, enough. If you're not going to be that way, I'm going to quit. If you're not going to really put your statement about work-life balance into practice, then I'm out of here. If you're not going to put your statement about DEI into practice, I'm out of here. And if you're not going to put your statement around wanting the environment to be sustainable and you're not going to take serious action toward that, then I'm out of here. So that's green world. And I think there's a lot of positive aspects of that. But the fourth one I think is most interesting, and that's called yellow world. Now, this is like a more of a decentralized green where... Everything is done for purpose, for a positive purpose. So individuals are very clear about who they are and why they're doing what they do. And so they're going to align with organizations that do that or that align with their views. So this is the world that we're promoting at Unbeatable with a lot of individual freedom to live the way you want to live in alignment with your principles and you do good and you be good. 
and organizations then are built around a good example is Mudwater and my work with Shane. Like they probably think they're in the green world, but their CEO is in the yellow world and he's building the organization around a save the world purpose that he truly believes. And he's attracting people to do that. And there's a lot of organizations popping up like that. So it's fascinating when you think about, and if you read this article, to think, where does my company fit in this? If I'm leading a company that is losing a lot of people, maybe I'm not organizing for the green or the yellow world. I haven't even thought of that yet. And if you haven't, then guess what? You will be disrupted. And who's going to disrupt you? Your clients and your employees are going to disrupt you because they're just going to say, screw it, I'm out. And everyone's going to be disrupted if you don't change. I think that's part of the point here in 2022. What we've learned is the change is inevitable and it's coming at us fast. And so we have to disrupt ourselves. Again, and this applies to both the individual and the organization. We have to disrupt ourselves. Then we have to develop a practice of continuous disruption, which when you flip the script becomes the ability to create. So disruption is just the flip side of if you don't create. If you're not a creator, and a lot of people think, oh, I'm not a creator. That's bull. Everybody is a creator. You wouldn't be on this human planet. Like you have the capacity to create. And creation comes from internal alignment, integrity, understanding your why. And then once you're clear about your why, you can create things. You can create things with your hands. You can create organizations. You can create projects. And so we develop that skill of creation until everything becomes a creation. Our lives is a constant creation. Organizationally, it's a constantly creating new adaptations to the changing environment. This is why it's hard. Change is hard because organizations were built in the Newtonian cause and effect world. And they kind of expected that if we have this plan, you know, remember the five-year plan? <laughs> it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. You can barely have a one-year plan now. No, you can't. And this notion of the yellow world is fascinating. We will definitely put that the URL in the show notes because it's yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Great. I want to make sure we get to some of these questions that you have from very, very dedicated fans. We posed this question to some Instagram and Facebook fans, and it was what questions they have for you regarding personal growth and development as we head into 2022. Yep. Okay, here we go. First question from Iron Jim 41. Why are some of us so much slower at finding our why and facing our true fear? So finding the why, I mean, we just talked about that. There is no magic formula, uh, but it does require introspection. And so I would suggest that the quality and the discipline around the introspection is going to be a determinant for how soon someone uncovers their why. So introspection, in my view, is a daily practice. That's why they say in the meditative traditions, practicing every day is key. If you practice a few days and then stop a few days and do a few days, then you get nowhere. And the analogy is like if you go to a gym and lift weights once a week, you really don't get much benefit. But if you lift every day or five days a week, then you get a lot of benefit and you gain momentum. So the quality of your introspection and your discipline to daily practice and asking the right questions will lead to uncovering the why. So if you haven't uncovered the why, then chances are one of those three things doesn't exist. And then back to the fears, facing your fears, that's a whole different subject, right? Facing the fears basically is to examine what is causing that sensation of fear and then to move closer to it instead of running away from it so you can understand it, close the understanding gap. And the more you close the understanding gap, then the less the fear has a hold over you until it literally can flip into courage. Okay, perfect. From at T-Star, the Netherlands went into another lockdown this Sunday. Any tips on how to deal with this mentally and emotionally? Um, move to Encinitas. <laughs> yeah, so the big four skills are always my go-to to deal with mental, emotional challenges. And this is, you know, external thing. So I can't control what the Netherlands are going to do. That would be my thought. I can't control. And so they're going to do this, but I live here. So I'm going to use these four skills to maintain balance and equanimity. First is breathe deeply through my nose and turn that into a practice. So we encourage the practice of box breathing, which has a controlled hold, five count in, hold, out, and hold, which is three breaths per minute. And then when you're not practicing, train yourself to breathe six times a minute. Okay, so that activates arousal control, which keeps you calm and bleeds off stress. Now I'm calm. Then I practice mindful awareness, which is basically examining the thoughts that are causing me to be negative or to be fearful and to basically get rid of those and to replace them with courageous thoughts. And then the third skill is to develop a positive image of yourself. 
and the future and to just hang on that image every day, regardless of what's going on outside of you. And then the fourth is just micro goals. Just focus on positive things every day that you can do that are, you know are going to be good for you and good for your family and good for your work. And just keep doing it one day at a time. Stop worrying about that outside stuff. Perfect. <laughs> Great answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's a question from at M-A-G-N-E-T-I-E. How do you deal in 2022 with slander and or hate crimes? <laughs> You know what? Unless it's directed at you, if your why includes social justice and one of your causes is to route out slander and racial slurs in the world, if your why includes that, then you're going to do everything you can to fulfill that why, to fight against, push back against those types of behaviors. If your why doesn't include that, then that is one of those things that can be really distracting for you because, you know, you can't control what other people do, even if it's despicable. And so why are you going to let it affect you? There's always going to be people like that. And so why are you letting them capture your mind, which is going to hold you back and just fill you with negative energy? So turn your mind toward something positive, turn your mind toward other things and ignore it. Now, if it's directed at you and you are the victim of it, then you've got to stand up for yourself, right? And so the only way to you have to confront it. But here's the thing that's key. If you confront it with hatred, then it just makes it worse. So you have to confront it with different energy. And this is what's really challenging. This part is really challenging for people. It's like, how do you confront hate with love? And that's a practice in itself, right? So forgiveness, and that doesn't mean you allow it, right? But you approach it and you deal with it from an openness and an understanding that the human condition and its frailties, you approach it with forgiveness but then you make sure that the person knows that it's not acceptable and you hold them accountable, either legally or through some other means. But if you do it with hate, then you leave a stain of hate on yourself and that's no bueno. How to counteract hate with love could be the key to world peace. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is from Philip underscore Durandon. How to overcome destructive and demotivating habits. Gosh, you know, the whole introductory soliloquy basically addressed that, didn't it? Yeah. It's like, if you have destructive habits, it's because you aren't clear about your values. And if you're not clear about your values, it's because you haven't investigated your beliefs. And if you haven't investigated your beliefs, then you're not clear about your why in life, right? And so once your why, your purpose is really clear, and you become radically aligned to becoming the person worthy to fulfill that purpose, and then there's a sense of urgency to eradicate the negative beliefs that are holding you back and reinforce the positive ones that'll move you forward. And then you'll eradicate the behaviors and habits associated with those negative beliefs as well and reinforce the values and the habits and the behaviors associated with those values that promote the positive beliefs that are connected to your sense of self, which is your why. And so it, again, it all comes back to that internal alignment, that integrity. And once you have that sense of clarity and that integrity, the old behaviors and habits often just fall away because you're focused so much on the new positive behaviors and habits. And similar to what we're talking about, you don't fight an old habit by beating yourself up about that habit. That just reinforces it. You fight an old habit that's not working for you by replacing it with something that is better, that's more effective or that is more positive. And then you just do that until the old habit dries up because you're not giving it energy anymore. And you read Atomic Habits. Oh, yeah. Atomic Havocs. By James Clear. James yeah. Clear is a great. And we got a podcast with him coming up soon. Yeah. Um, all right. Two more questions. This is from at P. Thompson 34. How much work is too much work? <laughs> work is too much work if you're not passionate about it and if it's leading to burnout, period. Right. It's not about number of hours because I know people who work 80 hours a week and they're completely passionate and fulfilled and healthy. And I think one named Amy Jerkowitz is in that category. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thriving. Because work is a really important thing for you and you're passionate about it. And you can do it really quickly. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of reasons why you organize your life and work very hard, but it doesn't lead to burnout. So if what you're doing is leading to a sense of burnout or despair or anxiety, then there's something wrong with that, either the work or your, your approach to it. Another interesting concept here is balance. Like, so work-life balance, there's never any actual balance. Just like a teeter-totter, never actually, we just talked about this yesterday, this teeter-totter will never actually find its center point. It can't. If you were try to align it perfectly, it'll tip from one side to another side. 
life is like that and work is like that. There's no perfect center point of balance. It's always just going back and forth between imbalance and rebalancing and imbalance. And so what your goal is when it comes to work, Phil, is to find the narrowest range, you know, of back and forth between going too far into work and then going too far into recovery. And so it's a very narrow range. You know, the old days is you work your ass off until you burn out and then you take a two week or 10 day vacation and you do nothing. And then you feel horrible about yourself because you've been sitting around like a loaf and, you know, maybe drinking too much. And, you know, part of that is like, yay, but then you can't wait to get back to work. And so you have these wild swings. And I think the new model is like, find the balance through your day-to-day actions. So you have little tiny little swings left and right and maintain more equilibrium, let's just say, in this set of balance. It's so true. I mean, someone had said that quote, allow your passion to become your purpose Mm -hmm. and it will one day become your profession. I like that. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's what I always say to my own kids. Like just find that passion and then work does not become work. Right. Then that's kind of the other part about it. It's like there's something wrong with your work or there's something wrong with your approach to work. So if you're not passionate about your work, then there's no way to avoid burnout. (laughs) Eventually it's going to catch up with you, right? All right. Here's our last question. And this is going to be a challenge because it's this is your elevator pitch really about everything you do. So you've got a minute and a half to answer this. <laughs> it's from at arthur.v.ortega. What is the fifth plateau you talk about? Okay. Fifth plateau is a developmental stage of pure integration. So everything we've talked about, like when you are acting in integrity, living in integrity and clear about why you're on this planet and you're moving toward that and you have a life practice and you're habituating those practices, which means you're growing and you're accelerating your growth, then what happens is you evolve through different developmental stages. These have been mapped by different development of psychologists, even mapped by Buddhist philosophy and yogic philosophy. And um, the fifth plateau is the beginning of the highest stage of development accessible to human beings. And you could break the fifth plateau into multiple micro plateaus as your consciousness expands even further and further. The fifth plateau is where you live in alignment with universal and spiritual principles. You have great care and concern and compassion for all sentient beings, starting with all humans, and then even looking at Mother Earth, Gaia, almost a a sentient being. And so there's no way you would live out of balance or do anything to harm another human being or to harm the Earth. Now, you can see how the concept of the yellow world plays into this. Yellow world will be driven by fifth plateau individuals who have care, compassion, and concern for the entire planet, as well as all of its inhabitants. And so we make decisions, we create organizations, we live our life in alignment with that through our daily actions, habits, behaviors, purchase decisions, etc. And so that's fifth plateau is that stabilize that level of awareness beyond ego, beyond ethnocentrism, beyond even world centrism to this notion that we are all one, but we are all unique then we can get to that place of fighting hate with love because there's no other option and bringing peace and prosperity into the world. That was fantastic. (laughs) You hit it on the nose and with eloquent language. (laughs) Awesome. Well, that's a wrap. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Jeff. I love answering questions from the tribe. What a blast. So I'm really looking forward to 2022. I think it's going to be an incredible year. Like we have learned so much. We've got so much opportunity ahead of us. We're all growing and we're all going to do amazing things this year. So stay focused. Um, I wanted to let you know that we've got a new site launched at markdivine.com or will be launched soon at markdivine.com. And this whole podcast is getting a facelift and up, up level and a new partner in podcast one, some new teammates I'll mention in a moment and a new kind of brand. So it's called the Mark Divine Show now. So who you out of that? I've also got a newsletter coming out called Divine Inspiration. If you want to be on the subscriber list for that, please go to markdivine.com and drop your email in. Show notes from this show and the transcripts will be on markdivine.com and the video will be going up on my YouTube channel, which is linked at the website. If you want to reach out to me on Twitter, my handle is markdivine. On Instagram and Facebook, it's at realmarkdivine. And you can always find me on LinkedIn. So if you have questions, you want to be included on one of these Q&A type podcasts in the future, then send us a note through social media or mark at markdivine.com. Special shout out to my amazing team, Jason Sanderson, Jeff Haskell, Michelle Zarnick, and Amy Jerkowitz, who co-hosted me today. Excellent job, Amy, who produce this podcast every week, bringing incredible guests and um, getting it to you in all the distribution channels. An amazing job, team. 
So I continue also to appreciate reviews. That's how other people find us. So if you like what we're doing here and the people we have on, please review our show and uh, continue to share it by referring it to your friends and parents and people that you work with. So that's it. Once again, Happy New Year, everybody. Let's make 2022 unbeatable and unbelievable. Ooh, yeah. <laughs>